This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The world today is neither tranquil nor peaceful. That's how President Xi Jinping described the harsh reality in a congratulatory message to the annual gala dinner of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. In the report to the just-concluded 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping pointed out that the world is at a crossroads. On a more positive note, though, he added that the historical trends of peace development, cooperation, and mutual benefit are unstoppable. The question for China is how to navigate through and bring about its much-vaunted human community with a shared future. The leadership of the CPC, with Xi Jinping as the core, has laid out the blueprint for China for the next five years and beyond. So how does China envision its future? How about diplomacy, security, global development and climate response? As China translates these visions into reality, what can the rest of the world expect? Welcome to a special panel discussion on the 20th CPC National Congress, Now and Beyond, brought to you by CGTN from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. We're honored to have an impressive lineup of panelists. Here in the studio, we have Dr. Sia Bongasvele, South African Ambassador to China, and Professor Xie Tao, Dean of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Warm welcome, gentlemen. We are joined online in alphabetical order by Arancha Gonzalez Laya, former Foreign Minister of Spain, now Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs at uh, Sciences Po. She was also Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the International Trade Center. We have Martin Jakes, a former Senior Fellow of the Department of uh, Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University. Baska Koirala, director of the Nepal Institute of International and Strategic Studies. Jumat Otobayev, former prime minister of Kyrgyzstan. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Eric Solheim, former UN Undersecretary General, now president of the Green Belt and Road Institute. Professor Tang Ki Jiap, Chairman of uh, Singapore National Committee for Pacific Economic Cooperation Council, and last but not least, Professor Zhang Weiwei, Dean of China Institute at Fudan University. The warmest welcome to all of you. And we are delighted to have as audience members, students and fresh graduates from universities in Beijing participating online. We are so happy to have all of the young people joining us today. Before we start the discussion, here are some comments from state leaders from five countries, namely Montenegro, Guyana, El Salvador, Indonesia, and Laos, on their expectations upon the conclusion of the CPC Party Congress. Idu mjesto koje Kina zauzima na globalnoj sceni, to je svakako razlog za poštovanje, rekao bih, najšire međunarodne zajednice, jer Kina upravo može da svojom veličinom, svojom dimenzijom veoma puno doprinese i doprinosi očuvanju stabilnosti i prosperiteta na globalnom planu. We have a climate crisis, we have an energy crisis, we have a food crisis, and we have, uh, if you want to put it this way, we have a, uh, a crisis that has always been with us, the inequality crisis. China can uh, provide its thought leadership and define uh, its part, its global support in these four areas. We would like to have this kind of leadership in the, in the world, to be aware and to present the initiative and to make it happen. Tetapi juga bisa juga menghasilkan keputusan yang bukan hanya berkontribusi bagi rakyat RRT, tetapi juga berkontribusi pada stabilitas kawasan 
juga berkontribusi pada perdamaian dunia dan juga berkontribusi pada kesejahteraan kawasan dan kesejahteraan dunia. Itu saya kira yang diinginkan oleh semua negara. พอรู้สึกว่ากองประชุมใหญ่ครั้งที่เศร้าของพรรคคอมมิวนิสต์จีนนี่จะเปิดขึ้นแม่นอยู่ในถามกลางสภาพของโลกสภาพภาคพืช
and the main media in the United States go along with this U.S. government line. So it is absolutely uh, true that uh, when I read, of course, the detailed report of President Xi, uh, there were so many interesting things that should have been reported, but all we got in the main Western media was China getting ready for conflict, uh, all harsh messages. This is, uh, th th this is a narrative that is in the United States. The U.S. is also trying to pull Europe into this negative narrative vis-a-vis -vis China. It is a huge mistake. I've been saying so for many years. And the media coverage in the United States was going along with this U.S. government narrative. We don't need these tensions. We don't need these conflicts. They're extraordinarily dangerous. We need, first of all, multilateralism under the UN Charter. We need and have a multipolar world. It's not a world that the U.S. leads, but sometimes many people in U.S. leadership, in the U.S. government think they lead the world. This is a huge mistake and a huge danger. But we need to reduce these tensions. And unfortunately, uh, right now in the U.S. political scene, there's actually a desire to raise the tensions. How it's extraordinarily you, dangerous. What are you reading um, that is important from the report, from the spirit of the report that is not mentioned by the mainstream U.S. narrative? What do you think is the complete China message? The true China message was a message of multilateralism that China wants a multilateral world under the UN Charter very explicitly. It doesn't seek uh, domination. Uh, it doesn't seek conflict in any way. Uh, and the message is absolutely explicit. This is not my interpretation. These are uh, the very words uh, that one finds if you actually read the report, not our newspapers. Uh, but the U.S. Uh, is in a, in a different game right now. Uh, the U.S. government, I should say. The American people, not so much, but the U.S. government uh, thinks that we are in a grand competition with China, that it's a, a devastating competition. Uh, we need to contain China. Many very harsh, absolutely anachronistic, dangerous ideas. By the way, at the same time, as we have a proxy war between the United States and Russia, because that war in Ukraine has a great deal to do with the American intention to push NATO into Ukraine and across the Black Sea into Georgia. And uh, this is another narrative that the United States doesn't want the people to know or understand, oh, yeah. but it's a reality. Yeah. So these tensions need to be reduced because the world is at an extremely dangerous crossroads right so, now. So, yeah, in the aftermath of this Congress and in this very dangerous mentality among some politicians in the West, where do you see the world going in the next five years with China trying to exercise maximum uh, restraint when it, when it comes to international geopolitics because it wants a peaceful environment for development? Of course it wants a peaceful environment. The peaceful environment has been wonderful for China's end of poverty and its economic development and its developing relations with other parts of the world. And we should absolutely celebrate those accomplishments, not view them as threats, but celebrate them. So what we need is dialogue. We need better understanding. We need uh, we, we need the leaders of China and the United States to meet routinely. We need governments to meet routinely so that this is a normal relationship. And we're not hearing that from the U.S. government. We're not hearing it from our media. But I think the intention stated very clearly from the 20th Party Congress is that's what China wants. And if China can explain that clearly to the world, that will be good because I hope other countries in the world will also say to the U.S. leaders, tone it down. We don't want these tensions. We don't want new Cold Wars. We don't want a divided world. We actually need cooperation to solve climate change, right. poverty, and other instabilities in the world today. Thank you very much for your valuable insight. Yeah, let's uh, continue the discussion here in the studio. I want to go to Professor Xie Tao. What is your take about these um, these calls for dialogue, calls for mutual understanding and 
not letting things spiral down. Um, President Xi actually quoted a Confucian truism in his report, which is dating back 2,500 years ago, and I'm going to quote here, all living things may grow side by side without harming one another, and different roads may run in parallel without interfering with one another. What does he want to say by quoting these, these words? I think President Xi's um, central message to the rest of the world is that China does want to commit itself to a peaceful world, and China pursues peaceful coexistence. And so you mentioned the Confucian aphorism, and so many years ago, we had this uh, peaceful, uh, harmonious world, harmony in diversity, or diversity in harmony. And so China does not impose or export its own values, institutions to the other countries. Neither does China would like to see other countries to tell us what you should do. And we all understand that China has a massive population. China is very different from many other countries. And so as President Xi Jinping, I think this is the central message of the 20th Party Congress report delivered by him is that China is going to achieve national rejuvenation through a Chinese mode or road to modernization. Now, modernization is a very complicated process. Every guest here probably knows more than I do about the process of modernization. It could be very bloody. It could be filled with armed conflicts. Many countries achieved its own modernization through colonialism, through occupation, um, you know, through a killing, mass killing. But you look at Chinese record, you know, China was never involved in the war since 1980, uh, since 1970s, uh, 1978. Chinese process of modernization, we look at China, we also emphasized this common prosperity you mentioned. It's a modernization for every Chinese. We lifted over 600 million people out of absolute poverty. This is a, an unprecedented historical achievement, right? And so I think, you know, this is a, what Chinese leadership really wants to convey to the world. Chinese people and the Chinese government mean everything peaceful. And we want to live peacefully together with the rest of the world. But let us do our way, basically. Um, Mr. Jakes, I'm calling you. Uh, you have always been commenting on Chinese affairs. And actually, this Chinese path of modernization has some concrete connotations. For instance, it's a modernization about uh, uh, harmony between humanity and nature. It's a uh, uh, modernization of a mass population. There's no country bigger than that, not yet. It's a modernization of both material and cultural ethics ethical prosperity, it's a um, modernization of peaceful development. Um, there are altogether five concrete connotations that President Xi articulated during the 20th Party Congress. Why now and why stressing these aspects? Well, I think China's uh, reached a point now where it's on the verge of a new kind of modernization in, in a range of different respects. I mean, economically, <laughs> Uh, clearly, China is now uh, in some ways on a par or not far behind the United States. And so one of the uh, key uh, proposals in uh, uh, President Xi's speech is the idea of a new kind of modernization. Now, what does that mean? Uh, well, I think it, it, it's, it essentially recognizes two things. The first thing, which we've been talking about, and I won't uh, spend a lot of time on, but the importance of a peaceful environment, a pe uh, the China's peaceful relationship with the world. China's always required this because it's been, its history ever since British Industrial Revolution has been so marked by war and aggression against it. So it's absolutely critical for China. But the point I want to emphasize here is one particular aspect, which is common prosperity, and that is, the difficulty with modernization, basically, for a long time, has been uh, largely influenced by the American model. Um, and part of that American model, key aspect, has been very great inequality. And China also, uh, in, uh, until recently, uh, had, well, still has a, a high level of inequality. And I think that common prosperity is about addressing this. So why should modernization be 
uh, synonymous in some respects with inequality. And I think uh, by challenging this and uh, making this a priority, not just growth, but a, a degree of equality uh, as a central uh, part of uh, China's approach, I think is really important because it's not just relevant for China. You see, uh, global, uh, under uh, American style globalization, inequality spread across virtually all societies. Now, if China can reverse that process and create a much more uh, equitable environment in its own country, I think this will have a very big impact around yeah. the world. A new kind, kind of modernization is inclusive. It's not exclusive. Right. It creates a new kind of harmony, not yeah. disharmony. And I think this is a very important possibility and message from the Congress. Ms. Arancha Gonzalez, you were uh, promoting trade, trade liberalization and trade facilitation, especially for underprivileged people in developing countries. What is your takeaway from China's emphasis on common prosperity and, you know, the larger version of it, which is common development, not just for China, but for other developing countries as well? I think this is the most important message that we should uh, keep in mind. Um, for the future. In the 21st century, whatever is good for China needs to be good for the rest of the world. And whatever is good for the rest of the world needs to be good for China. This is the 21st century. We are living in the same planet. Uh, we have the same difficulties, uh, whether it's uh, managing pandemics, whether it's ensuring financial stability, whether it is the existential challenge of our time um, to manage climate change, or whether it's to ensure we leave no citizen behind. For this, it's important that what works for China works for the rest of the world and vice versa. Because if it doesn't, then we will enter into a zero-sum world, and a zero-sum world is a world that will leave lots of people behind. Now, the economy is a big part of making sure we leave no one behind. This is why I think it's important that uh, this process of uh, opening the economy and reforming the economy in China, the one that has reaped so many benefits in terms of competitiveness, innovation, um, growth, and ultimately eradication of poverty, be continued. Keep opening the economy, keep reforming the economy. It's good for China, but it will be also very important for the rest of the world, in particular uh, developing countries. And in doing so, of course, uh, make sure, as Agenda 2030 of the UN uh, clearly advocates, that you work to ensure you leave no citizen behind. This is uh, a bit what uh, is the challenge in the 21st century. Ensure we've got responses for our global common uh, challenges. Ensure that we have economies that innovate, that create, that remain competitive, and ensure that the distribution of the costs and the benefits is fair. I want to turn to uh, Professor Zhang Weiwei, a renowned speaker on the China model. Um, Professor Zhang, do you also think that uh, the common prosperity, the efforts to address inequality, some of the inherent problems of modernization, is the central key message from this Congress? Yes, there is a very clear objective uh, set for the year 2035. China should achieve substantially this level of common prosperity. And the China model has one interesting feature, that is whatever we do, we'll have a pilot project. This time, we set out a whole province, Zhejiang province, as a site for experimentation. The Zhejiang is interesting because it resembles more or less the whole landscape of China, 70% mountainous areas, 10% uh, rivers, uh, waters, you know, 20% uh, arable lands. And uh, so now we try to experiment uh, basically several approaches, when, how to overcome income gap, how to uh, reduce rural uh, urban gap, and how to reduce regional gaps. And Zhejiang has been conducting experiments in all these three areas. And what's more important is uh, within three years, by the year 2025, three years from now, Zhejiang should achieve this 
national objective for the year 2035, 10 years ahead. So you can look at the Zhejiang, how they have done. For instance, concerning this uh, urban-rural gap, one major problem is uh, in rural areas and urban areas, hospitals are much better in urban areas. Right. So now I have this appointment, they send the urban doctors from urban area cities to the countryside, to rural areas on the regular terms. So this approach. And then concerning this income gap, the policy is very clear about expanding the middle class. They have very specific targets by which year, by which year they will achieve that what? purpose. Yeah. And then concerning this region differences, they have between the cities, between the counties, between the rich region and poor region yeah. within Zhejiang province. I want to go to our Kyrgyz friend, uh, Mr. Orobayev, former prime minister there. Let's switch to a different topic. For quite some time now, China has been advocating a new type of international relations that calls for equality, openness, cooperation, and broadening the convergence of interests with other countries. China has uh, recently, as we all know, proposed the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative. But how do you look at the, the voices of worries about whether China is on the right side of history when it comes to international relations, when it comes to geopolitics? Uh, this issue is extremely important for us as neighbors. So we live together for centuries and centuries. We know each other and emergence of China during the last 40 years is great news for us. So now we're communicating, cooperating very closely, economically, politically, socially, people to people communication. So far things moving very well. So what everybody observing now is that China has uh, 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 Communist Party 20th Congress claimed that it will go for modernization and high quality development. In retrospect, I would like to emphasize point to high quality development. This is extremely important for our countries because we as a former Soviet Union country have very highly educated population. So we are ready to work with China on high quality development. What does it mean? For China, it very clearly means that it will move on overcoming the middle income trap. So within very short, either this year or early next year, China will over overcome next barrier and will come uh, to the class, to the uh, to the certain group of uh, leaving this middle income uh, country group. How to move on to the high income countries group? Very simple, you need to improve completely uh, this, uh, the, the, the structure of your economy. Going from the, for example, export-oriented, cheap labor, uh, privileged country to highly educated, innovative, uh, high quality development. What is happening is that now China moving quickly to that direction. If you look to the semiconductors, yes. to green economy, to whatever we're talking, it's moving very quickly. So we wanted to be part of it. I mentioned many times that let's China organize in Hangzhou or Shenzhen or Beijing, Silicon Valley. Well, all talents around the world will be coming to go inventories, discoveries. Us as Central Asians, we are ready to be part of this Asian Silicon Valley where new discoveries and new mm. uh, inventions will come on and we will move together to the 21st century. How interesting. So we need yeah. infrastructure, yes. We need yeah. development aid, yes. But we need investment to human capital to be together with China okay. on high quality development. It is our goal. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Very important keywords you mentioned there, which is high quality development. And in the uh, Congress report, this is mentioned that China wants to engage at a higher level with the international economy. Let me turn to my guests in Singapore, Professor Tang Ji Jiab. Professor Tang, um, from your expectations, what does China's emphasis on high quality integration into the global economy or higher level engagement in the global economy. What does that mean? And what's the implication for countries in Southeast Asia? 
Well, it means a lot to us, and that is why we are watching the 20th Communist Party Congress very carefully and closely, especially the speech by President uh, Xi Jinping. And there are two aspects which caught my attention, and one is on the uh, quality growth. Uh, uh, here, uh, we read the quality growth as green, smart, and technology. Now, this green growth is so important, and smart cities, urbanization, which China is going through in a massive scale, and also with the technology advancement in so many areas. I think this is the high quality growth that uh, many uh, countries outside China can also participate, especially Singapore in the urbanization process and also in the uh, green environment experiences. And I think there's another aspect, second aspect, which is very reassuring because before the 20th Party Congress. There were so many talk about China will become more inward looking. But towards uh, the later part of the speech, I noticed President Xi Jinping was very clear that the reform and the opening up of China will be even wider. Now, this means a lot to us because China contributed to 30% or more than 30% of the world growth. So if you look at if China were to opening up more, which means that imports, services, from the rest of the world can come to China, this huge market. And then also when it comes to the export, if China deepens its reform, I think the rest of the world will benefit. I think for the next five years, the development of China is very clear. Quality growth, green, smart, and technology-driven growth, and opening up and deep reform. And we are impressed by that, and we are also excited by, by the latest speech. Hmm. Thank you for these uh, positive feedbacks. Um, let me get to my guest from Nepal, Mr. Koirala. I noticed in a previous uh, uh, media story you wrote about possible dilemmas for countries that are caught in between bigger countries. Um, do you see a way out? Do you see that it may not be that reality for neighbors of China, which are small in size? Uh, of course, uh, there is a way out. Um, uh, and this uh, requires a lot of uh, dexterity uh, on the part of uh, countries like mine. I think also requires uh, the, the, the big powers, uh, the great powers uh, to uh, appreciate the constraints uh, and the difficulties uh, that small uh, I mean, developing countries uh, uh, like mine uh, often face as they you know, look out into the world. Uh, mm -hmm. and seek to connect themselves uh, to uh, the, the development achievements and uh, the extraordinary um, success stories, uh, especially of a, a country like, uh, like China. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, as long as we have um, the uh, uh, regular um, uh, contacts and regular dialogues, uh, this is uh, very essential, I think, to achieve uh, what you are referring to. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We are going to take a very short break. You have been watching a special edition on CGTN on the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. We'll be back right after this. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. The much-anticipated 20th National Congress of the CPC has successfully wrapped up. Xi Jinping has been re-elected General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, and a blueprint has been drawn up for the country for the next five years and beyond. How does China envision its future? How about diplomacy, security, global development, and climate response? As China translates these visions into reality, what can the rest of the world expect? Welcome to part two of a special panel discussion on the 20th CPC National Congress, Now and Beyond, brought to you by CGTN. We're pleased to be joined online by Benjamin Pogosian, Chairman of the Center for Political and Economic Strategic Studies in Armenia. Welcome to the panel. Benjamin, let me go straight to you. Uh, you have been watching the developments both in Beijing and, of course, in Europe, where a crisis 
is deepening, where the uh, conflict is not letting up and inflation is rising, political chaos in the United Kingdom. So what is your takeaway from the kind of stability and predictability that China is trying to send out through the Congress? We really appreciate that the Communist Party of China's 20th Congress sent a clear message that China does not see the world through confrontational lenses. China does not want to have confrontation. China is for peaceful coexistence, China for cooperation. And this is really a very significant message, because otherwise, if uh, all great powers will say that, OK, we are going to compete or we are going even to war into each other, and small and middle powers should choose, and who are against us, it automatically means that we are going to war, or small and middle powers will be forced to make a choice. So in this case, we, as a powers who are not the great powers, we're really interested to see cooperation between great powers as much as possible. And in this regard, Chinese position that we are against Cold War mentality, we are against to divide the world into black and white, it's really, really very much appreciable. Mm. Well, China definitely wants a peaceful modernization, as I said, one of the five uh, aspects of the Chinese path of modernization. Another key integral part of that is about the relationship between humanity and nature, which is extremely important, according to President Xi, because for the past 10 years, he has repeatedly stressed the importance of uh, environmental protection, climate change response, ecological diversity and conservation, so on and so forth. So uh, last but not least, let me turn to my dear friend, Eric Solheim, who is uh, now president of the Green Belt and Road Institute. Thank you very much for bearing with me. As I said, how Germany has been put to an even higher level of importance, I would even say, right? Harmony between humanity and, uh, and nature. What is your takeaway when China is stressing green and low carbon development? If we don't dig into every detail, but take a historical view of the party congress, three things stand out in my view. This was the first party congress after China has, bro has brought poverty, extreme poverty, to zero. Uh, China's done that at a higher speed, at a higher number of people than any other power in human history. So it's a major achievement and should be celebrated by the world. Secondly, it was a message of peace from the Congress. Look, China has not been into any war for the last 40 years. United States, Russia, European powers, basically everyone else has been uh, into a war. So this is from a historical perspective, fantastic and major power of the world, not intervening in any war. And the third is ecological civilization. China is now the world leader on basically every green technology. If you may, and the, the main problem is of course that there is the view in the United States that it's hard to accept another power at the level of the United States. That's deep down in the US, but also in the wider West. It's hard with Western arrogance for us to accept uh, China as an equal power. But fortunately, there are two main counter forces. One is business. Uh, the in level of economic integration is increasing. The trade level between the United States and China will reach its peak this year. It will not go down. Even with the tension is increasing, we are becoming more and more dependent on each other. And the second force is, which was very well set out from Armenia, no other nation want to choose. When the security advisor of the United States asked African leaders, he told them, oh, you need to choose between the United States or uh, China, either you have a China or you have the US. Not one African leader raised his or her hand. No one want to choose. We all, all other nations in the world basically want to benefit from investment, technology, trade with both the United States and China. We want to have people-to-people's -people's relationship with both nations, and we want to have stable political relations to one. So if the United States ask the world to choose, they will have a very hard time because no other nation really want to have that choice. Yeah. Well, you mentioned African leaders, uh, whether they you know, are feeling pressure to take sides, whether China is doing that, at least uh, we have a showcase here. So Amb Ambassador Dr. Swelle, let me um, ask for your personal experience here. When you are cooperating with China, what is 
the atmosphere? What is the tone? Is there any pressure from the Chinese side? So do businesses with us and forget about the United <laughs> States or don't deal with the West or, you know, uh, you, you can't have both. Is there ever that? No, not, not at all. Uh, I think what characterizes the relationship, particularly with China and South Africa and many African countries, is that one of mutual respect, beneficial cooperation. And uh, uh, we never even have, uh, because we come from long histories of occupation and uh, colonization, and uh, our own civilizations and culture were <laughs> largely destroyed. And uh, because we're being civilized in a foreign way, and they never took into account how we have sustained ourselves for so many years. So when we look, for instance, in the recent uh, Party Congress, which looks not just as other colleagues have said, just simply economic growth, they look at human development, put a person in the center. Uh, it looks at cultural, positive cultural development and advancement not to suppress or change other people's culture. Build on them, take the positive aspects out of it. China never really comes with any coercion uh, when they come to us. They'll say, these are our policies, that's what works for us. Take what will work in your own context in Africa. So those are very positive yeah. things we, should, we think we're exactly. getting. Exactly. Actually, that's, yeah. that's what some people are worried about. Yeah. Like, people are saying, okay, China is giving an alternative to modernization, and they are afraid <laughs> that they're going to lose the race because everybody will go into <laughs> follow China's example. Mm. Uh, but for many mm. countries, actually, for a lot of countries who adopt Western mm. institutions and Western values, do you think it is still possible to learn from different practices? I, I, I think there's a, le a lot of t uh, to learn, particularly from developing countries. Let's just take a few things. Poverty alleviation. Eliminating extreme poverty is a major, major achievement. But, you know, in China, we have that, and we have a very organized institution, you know, the yeah. party is extremely organized yeah. and uh, very disciplined, so they yeah. can work in, co you know, yeah. what about in South Africa? Can yes. you actually... We, we do link with the people, but what we need, the, the party, what has made it more distinctive, it's not just an ideology is to empower even party members with skills. Mm -hmm. The skills to perform hard work. Hard work, what, what we're learning as developing countries, that we can achieve these things. If we work harder, if we remain united and focus and follow our own programs of implementation, we can achieve, we can develop. We can face all these uh, <clears throat> devastating things which are confronting us. We can cooperate with like-minded countries. So <clears throat> we, we are not, uh, uh, not going to be made to choose. We have got a young population. We'll accept anyone who respects our own systems and come to partner with us. We are looking for partnerships. We are not looking for cohesion. And uh, anyone who wants to partner with African countries who are saying yes. If we check, for instance, the program of cooperation, what is called FOCAC or Road and Belt and Road Initiative in Africa, there's been a lot of criticism. But it, what has made uh, a difference? The colonial power, we're building infrastructure which goes to port, not connecting even the country. But with China's participation in Africa, we're seeing a lot of infrastructure connecting within the country and connecting the neighbors. And that's why now that we have started this uh, free trade area in Africa, where we're promoting intra-trade among ourselves. And that's what is going to make Africa to rise. Mm. We see it as the most beneficial mm. uh, 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 way of cooperation. So we see China as a strategic partner. And we're calling for other developed nations to follow suit and cooperate with us and uh, mix their programs to link with the African programs because we have got our own vision in of course. Agenda 2063, which we're implementing in Africa. Right. Thank you.
Professor Shear, you have been watching, you have been hearing all of these. What is your uh, most pressing comment you want to you share? What is the point that uh, you have been impressed the most about? Or you want to talk about, yeah. respond yeah, now? I, I just want to follow up with the ambassador. He mentioned about the importance of uh, very capable or competent uh, government officials. So he said, you know, we can have institutions of elections, we can have organizations, but he also mentioned that you do need to have dedicated, competent, and uh, professional people, people who are willing to work for the people. And so you don't just have uh, organizations. We all know there are almost every country in the world has political parties, but many of these political parties are not so well organized, and many of them don't have very good people to work on behalf of the party and on behalf of the people, right? Second, I want to just follow up with this uh, Chinese uh, diplomacy and how China tries to interact with the world. We all know that you can lead either by example or generosity or multilateral cooperation, or you can lead by coercion. You can lead by predation and the unilateral action. And so I think China obviously has pursued the first route. We want to lead the world, not because China wants to be a hegemon, but rather we want to lead by providing benefits to the rest of the world. We want to lead by example, by generosity, and by multilateral cooperation. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's a good example, and that's an example that has been widely hailed by many countries around the world. Let me go to Eric. I'm sure Eric has a lot of passion for this topic. President Xi stressed in the report that China will play an active part in international climate governance. From the track record of what China has been doing over the past 10 years in terms of environmental protection, ecological conservation and climate response, what is your expectation about the activeness China will uh, demonstrate in fighting climate change? China has turned itself around on the environment at a higher speed than any other nation in human history. I mean, let's be honest, 10 years ago, Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, basically every city in uh, northern China was horribly polluted. And then the people said, we don't want to live this way any longer. We want to see the skies. And that message was understood very well by the political leadership, and they started to act. And now pollution has come down in China at a speed. I mean, it may be China's done in seven years, what took us three or four decades in Europe and North America. Right. And basically, you can see the skies and the beautiful, uh, beautiful sun uh, in, in, in Beijing. And that sets an example for the world. China is by far the most important uh, on a green investment. Basically, every value chain in, for renewables in the world are not, to are not totally dominated by China. And Belt and Road is, of course, an eminent way of bringing these investments to other developing countries, but indeed also to other developed uh, countries. So, so China has a big role to play uh, on, uh, on the investment side. Added, China more and more is also now best practice for the environment. Massive tree planting, bringing down pollution, fishing ban in Yangtze, which is a major undertaking. Uh, the, the greening of the deserts in Inner Mongolia. Uh, the uh, uplifting of the water, water quality in Shenzhen province, which was mentioned here by, uh, by Professor Shang. There are so much to learn from, from China now for the rest of the world. But of course, Belt and Road must also be about mutual learning. China can also pick up ideas uh, from other parts of the world and implement them in China. One of the most inspiring of all slogans is when President Xi is speaking about beautiful China. Yes. And through that, creating the atmosphere that we need to take but better care of this fantastically beautiful nation. Mm. Um, let me turn to Professor Zhang Weiwei. What are some of the signs you are seeing about the resilience of the Chinese economy? Because that is really a lot of people, what a lot of people are watching, because they live day by day, check by check, and they want to see that China's economy is not doing too badly so that their no. income will mm -hmm. be not mm -hmm. uh, reduced. What, what are you seeing about the resilience and the state of the Chinese economy, to wrap up? Uh, basically, the Chinese economy is uh, slowing down. Uh, of course, it has to do with the global uh, economic crisis, but it also has to do with China's deliberate strategy to restructure its economy. 
Rather than just printing money, China made a resolute effort to restructure its economy, move into high quality growth. I'll give you an example. Uh, this year, China's exports of automobiles has exceeded, surpassed Germany. And next year, it will surpass Japan. And of this automobile industry, China is now the leader in electric cars, renewable energy cars. So that has to do with a long-term strategy of restructuring the economy. Rather than focusing on uh, traditional cars, we focus on electric cars and with exact six five-year plans, which means three decades of effort, long-term commitment, now to produce very good result. This is not only the result of uh, commitment to renewable energy, green strategy, but also to electric cars, and then it bells out fruits. So this is kind of long-term objective and uh, ability to exit policies provides certainty. Uh, by the way, I just read a report this morning yes. uh, by World Bank. Uh, of the past 10 years, China has uh, contributed to, to uh, the increase of world economy by 38%, more than the combined total contribution of the G7, that's 25%. So anyway, it's, uh, everything is the international comparison. With this kind of uh, size of the contribution, I think China has done, uh, uh, in my Chinese modesty, its share of uh, contributions, uh, to be fair. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. And it's going to be, as President Xi said, the future is bright, but we still have a long way to go. Um, anybody watching us, any audience member has a question or a comment, now is the time to raise your hand. And yes, I see a young lady raising her hand. The one with the black cap. Yes. Hello, Professor Xie. Mm -hmm. I am a graduate student of SIRD from BFSU, and <laughs> I do have a question for you. I'm just wondering, how do you think China can convince other countries in the world that China will not pursue hegemony or expansion, but peaceful development? Thank you. I think she's very much influenced, probably read the book by John Mearsheimer, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. It seems like you know, people are arguing that a two cup, uh, powers of the size of the United States and China are destined to clash with each other. The clash of titans, you, know, you may say. Uh, but I think the Chinese leadership has made this very, very clear and repeatedly reassured the international community that number one, China has a proven record of peacefully living with the world, right? Second, China is committed to international cooperation through an international system centered around the United Nations. And third, of course, people, can, people like Jan Biersheimer would say, how can I predict what you are going to do tomorrow? Nobody can predict what's going to happen tomorrow. But I think we all have credibility, reputation, and we all care about our national pride and other things, like Professor Zhang said, Chinese economy also depends on many, many things. And the, the first and the foremost is a peaceful environment for China. So I think you know, uh, the international observers who are so deeply worried about a so-called China threat, they may be reassured and they may rest that at least for a long, long time, you know, China will continue to do this. In fact, I think there are other countries who you should be more worried about than China itself. Yeah. Okay. Many thanks to all our panelists for your wonderful insight and extremely valued uh, Ambassador of South Africa, Dr. Svele, Professor Xietao from Foreign Languages University of Beijing, and of course, uh, Professor Zhang Weiwei from Fudan University, Arantxa Gonzalez from Sian's Pool, um, Mr. Um, Pogosian from Armenia, Eric Solheim, the president of uh, Green Belt and Road Institute, uh, and many thanks to our young audience members for joining us. With that, we come to the end of uh, the special panel discussion on the 20th CPC National Congress, Now and Beyond, brought to you by CGTN. I'm Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thanks for watching. You've got the point. 